Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I know, as Liz was saying, we're well into the halfway mark, if not further, into uh, today's uh, time to really educate ourselves on lymphoma. And I know for myself, as a healthcare provider, I've learned so much. And I'm hoping that I will be able to share a little bit more of my, uh, my expertise, which is in exercise. So um, what I do is I'm actually a registered kinesiologist with the College of Kinesiologists, and I'm also an exercise physiologist. So with my training, I've also been uh, working in the sort of the realm of cancer and exercise for the last 10 years, um, specifically at Wellspring Cancer Support Foundation, uh, as well as with um, some years at uh, Princess Margaret Hospital in the Elixir Division. Um, aside from uh, formalized exercise, I'm also a yoga teacher and a Reiki practitioner. So I'm hoping to give you some um, support, some guidelines, um, some information on how to get started um, if you are coping with uh, fatigue. So our agenda is really looking at uh, understanding what fatigue is. And as you can probably see from today's uh, time and the, and the different lectures we've been attending to, it, you will come across that everyone experiences it very differently, and we're going to chat about that. We're going to talk about strategies to manage uh, fatigue, as well as looking at uh, the modality of exercise. What can exercise specifically do for you? So first, I just wanted to define cancer-related fatigue. So cancer-related fatigue is the extreme tiredness that is not proportional to the activity done, and it doesn't necessarily go away after. Um, it can cause not just physical fatigue, but it can cause uh, mental exhaustion and emotional exhaustion. Um, and it's often the most common uh, reported symptom in lymphoma. So when I do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, assessment, fitness assessment, um, usually what I, what I ask of is when I'm asking a, uh, a, a patient about their fatigue, they may be sharing certain very specific uh, descriptions about their tiredness. So it's the type of tiredness that doesn't get better after rest or after sleeping. Um, it's also not necessarily related to an activity or while you're doing a certain activity, you're really tired and then the tiredness just continues on. Um, there's that feeling or sensation of heaviness of the legs, the arms, um, a lot of people use the words, I have no energy, no stamina, I feel very weak. Um, a lot, there are a lot of people who describe themselves as spending more than usual time in bed um, or resting. Um, and then there's that aspect of, of uh, losing or, or, or sort of lacking in concentration and focus when they're uh, either at work or at school or even just trying to read the newspaper, for example. And then this can impact uh, their ability to do work, to go to school, or complete day-to-day -day routines. So what exactly causes fatigue? So this is a really interesting thing to uh, really look at because there's no real answer. There's nothing specific at this point from a literature perspective that can identify this is the reason for fatigue because it can be quite, quite complex. As you can see the diagram on the side, Cancer-related fatigue can be impacted by the cancer itself, if you are uh, uh, impacted by the disease at this moment, if you have received treatment, if you're dealing with pain, not necessarily from the side effects, but if you're dealing uh, with a muscle injury or um, a, a knee replacement, anything in conjunction with your cancer diagnosis. If you're anemic, it will also contribute to fatigue. Um, if you have other medical issues, so um, if you're dealing with a heart issue, uh, issues with your liver, that can also impact it. Um, uh, nutrition is another aspect of it. If you're currently taking medications, um, there can be side effects where in, in fine writing it could say, you know, you will be experiencing fatigue. Um, and so what we're looking at really is that it doesn't necessarily have to be one thing, it could co be a combination of everything. And that's why having that connection with your physician um, or your care team really looks at trying to identify which one is it or which of these it is, so that you have a better idea of what are some strategies that can work for you. So how can fatigue really impact your day-to-day -day life? So again, when I'm talking to my patients, things such as getting dressed, taking a bath independently, making a cup of tea, 
feels overwhelming sometimes to even think about, not necessarily actually doing it. Um, social activity, so having someone visit you in your home versus or even thinking about uh, meeting up with friends in a social environment also can be very exhausting. Um, you may end up taking time off work or school. Uh, you may find, again, there's that uh, really the, the evidence behind brain fog or chemo brain uh, can also worsen if you're feeling very, very tired. You may have issues with sleep where you're having uh, difficulty falling asleep or you're just spending a lot of time sleeping. Um, and then there's the other aspect where a lot of people find it's very demotivating to do anything, interacting with family members, doing um, enjoyable tasks and hobbies feels quite strenuous. So how long can it last? So again, this is one question that I get asked a lot as an exercise professional. And everyone is different. Their experience is different. The time frame in which they've been uh, dealing with the fatigue can be different. Um, some people notice that they do feel better after they've had their treatment with either their chemotherapy or their radiation. And it could be months after treatment, but there are many individuals that are, do find that there is a long-lasting uh, effect uh, of, of fatigue, but it's uh, reduced quite significantly, that it's, it's become almost manageable now. So at what point do you discuss this with your doctor in terms of the, uh, any worrisome thoughts that you have about your fatigue? Well, if you notice that you spend about 24 hours in bed, so that is consistently in bed, you really want to either have your uh, partner or yourself to contact your doctor about it. If you find you're feeling quite confused, dizzy, uh, loss of balance, you want to discuss that with your team. Uh, problems waking up, um, either in the morning or from a nap. Uh, if you're noticing shortness of breath, and that doesn't necessarily have to do with activity. So it's not you running up and down stairs, it's um, you know, walking to one side of your house to the other side and noticing you're completely out of breath. Um, and if you notice that there is a progression of the fatigue, you want to make sure that that information is relayed to your medical team, whether it's your nurse, your oncologist, um, your occupational therapist, your social worker, that your team is aware of that. So when I do an initial assessment, there are very specific questions I like to ask specifically around fatigue. For me, it actually helps me design a, an appropriate exercise program for you. But these may be questions that you may be um, engaging in with your care team too. So they may ask you, when did the fatigue first begin? Um, how long has it now lasted for? Uh, has it changed over time in any way? Does it come and go? Um, does anything in particular make it better or make it worse? Um, does your fatigue happen to impact your day-to-day -day routine? So those specific questions for me determine what time of day you might be exercising, what type of routine I might be designing for you. So it actually gives me a lot of information so I know that what I will offer you will not worsen your fatigue. So firstly, I want to really make an, uh, a strong acknowledgement for caregivers, um, whether it's your partner, whether it's a family member, whether it's a, a personal support worker that is there for you as you, through your patient experience, um, because not only can the fatigue really feel isolating and feel like in many ways um, invisible, um, having to relay this on a regular basis to your, your caregiver can also be a bit of a challenge, but of course there's a certain level of fatigue that your caregiver will also be uh, coping with. So some ways to support um, the patient experience from the perspective of a caregiver is seeing if it's possible uh, to prep some meals, do gentle house cleaning for that either family member or friend, um, yard work, grocery shopping. Um, if you live uh, with your uh, partner, you may be helping to assist them with their day-to-day -day routine. And just acknowledging that um, when you know, the patient, in fact, is relaying that they're just too tired, they're overwhelmed, you want to make sure that there is no sense of push in having to do more than what they're capable of doing. So these are some strategies that are very well researched to help manage fatigue. And we're actually going to go through this together. Um, one is CBT, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy, or any sort of formalized talk therapy or counseling, can be a really effective tool to 
understanding not just what's happening on a fatigue level, the tiredness, but how you're coping with it. Um, exercise, which I'm gonna really focus on for the second half of the presentation, can also help support your fatigue. Uh, diet plays a huge role, as we had he heard earlier. Meditation is a beautiful practice to help relieve and manage fatigue. Sleep hygiene, so understanding how your evenings are planned so that you're most likely to either be able to sleep deeper through the night or find strategies to make sure that you're able to wake up at, at the time you'd like to wake up in the morning. And I'd like to discuss some complementary, uh, complementary therapies too. So if you have had access within the, your hospital setting to meet with an occupational therapist or meet with a social worker, or even if you've had a chance to work with a kinesiologist, usually when we talk about fatigue and managing fatigue, we use the terminology energy conservation. So if I could give you an example, if we have that one bottle of water here and it's filled up to the top, and if I asked of you that you only have this one uh, one bottle to finish within the day, but if you're finding you're someone who has a ton of energy in the morning and you're completed, completely depleted at 11, you may be drinking that entire um, cup or mug of water right in the beginning of the day. So what you wanna do is look at the concept of an energy bank or the water, really as an example, to see if it's possible to do a little bit throughout the day rather than the burst of energy where that's the time you're gonna load the dishwasher, uh, do a load of laundry and fit in a workout, which that, at the end of the day, would mean being completely fatigued, possibly not just for the afternoon, but two to three days after. Because that actually does happen a lot with patients that I interact with, is they want to do more, they're ready to do more, but the problem is their body is giving them information that they're just not ready. Um, so we use the concept of the three Ps, which is planning, prioritizing, and pacing. So planning is really looking at, consider the amount of energy you have and how much energy it takes to do each activity. That's also the point where you wanna think about what are some realistic um, activities that you can participate that won't drain you. Asking for help, whether it's a caregiver or friends, to see if it's at all possible that if there are certain tasks that you really need to get done, is it possible that they can assist you on that? And also, if it's possible to also be aware of if there are particular activities that actually give you a bit of a boost of energy. Uh, the next P is prioritizing. So we spoke about, I've spoken about this briefly, but figuring out exactly within the day, what is it that you have to accomplish? Is it paying your bills? Is it, do you really want to be able to work out to, add, to boost up your energy, making sure that there's time for that? Um, and then also, of course, the day-to-day -day tasks. If your priority is to make sure that you've showered and that's the top of the list, maybe for the morning that you've got that burst of energy, that's your focus, is the showering. You take a rest break and then see how the rest of the day goes to see if there's a possibility of adding another task in. And then I think most importantly is pacing, is making sure that you're taking actually smaller breaks throughout the day rather than doing you know, one large activity and then spending two to three hours to recover, whether it's sleeping or resting, because that can impact your ability to sleep at night, for example. So taking short breaks throughout the day can really support um, how you're managing your day. So one thing I ask my patients to do, and again, if this is something you're experiencing, is to consider doing a fatigue journal. So a fatigue journal is an, uh, a way to track your energy level throughout the day. Um, so you're trying to look for any patterns with your fatigue. So anytime someone has uh, told me about their fatigue, I ask them to write on a, a booklet or a piece of paper their fatigue for a few days, whether they're waking up at 8 a.m. I ask them to write what activity it is, and then one other column, they, I ask them to rate their fatigue. Zero being no fatigue up to 10, which is unmanageable. So sometimes we don't necessarily know in the moment how tired we are. So it does help to have a general idea, especially if you're doing it for a few days, to see if there's any pattern, if there's certain tasks that you feel in your mind like, oh, I'm actually able to do this, and then you actually write down, actually, by the end of that task, that was nine out of 10. I was so exhausted. I ended up you know, resting or napping for four hours after. So fatigue journal is a really, really effective tool to manage um, and, and really learn about your own body. And it actually helps it easier to plan your activities, uh, take rest breaks, and 
hopefully get a sense of some level of empowerment over um, your fatigue. So I'm not gonna go over this slide too long just because we had a, a, a really good dietitian speaking about it, but as we know, when it comes to fatigue, it can impact, and uh, in, in both ways really, impact your appetite, your taste, your swallowing, during treatment and can also impact it, of course, afterwards. So it's important to make sure that you're getting enough of your caloric needs met. Uh, dehydration has a huge impact on fatigue, so making sure you're getting enough fluids, um, as well as if you have access to uh, the, the internet and reviewing the uh, Canadian Food Guide, which I feel like their update is pretty amazing, um, recognizing the rainbow of food that uh, we had spoken about earlier and recognizing that you want to ideally keep your blood sugar levels stable. And what you're going to notice is that if you are choosing to exercise, making sure that you're hydrated through your exercise and making sure that you're also eating something before exercise and after exercise also make sure that you're not uh, depleted afterwards. Because there are many people that I've worked with over the past where um, they're still sort of trying to come to terms with what diet works for them, what they're able to eat. But they are finding that if they make the, uh, if they keep that attention on making sure they've had some sort of calories before they've uh, worked out, with within 30 minutes post workout, they've also had some sort of a protein based snack, they're actually able to sustain their energy level, if not see some improvement within the day. And of course, if you're not 100% sure, being connected to a dietitian, um, either through your oncologist or your family doctor, is a great resource. I would even say that there are a lot of community-based organizations that um, specifically look at um, nutrition and cancer. So Wellspring runs a program called Nourish, which is often at the Westerkirk site at Sunnybrook, where they nearly almost every week or every other week um, it's basically, it's actually great if you have a chance to go. Um, there's a dietitian that uh, cooks a meal, usually a three course meal. You sit, you watch, you learn, you eat. And that's one of the best ways, especially if you're looking at changing um, uh, some of your palates and you're curious about certain things to eat. I personally am like that. I'm not very good at uh, Pinteresting and looking at pictures online. I need to taste something for me to really recognize if I want to make that change. Um, Elixir also, which is uh, um, also an organization in the basement of Toronto General, once a month also hosts a nutrition-based cooking class too that's free of charge for anyone diagnosed with any form of cancer. And Gilda's Club also runs um, nutrition-based programming there too. Um, often all of these are run by dietitians or chefs. Um, another component that I really want to take a second to uh, really think about is mindfulness. And mindfulness has a key component to fatigue in the sense when we're looking at our organs. So if you are dealing with either stressful thoughts, whether they be negative thoughts or just Coming to that space of recognizing um, those questions in your mind, why did this happen to me? Why am I still dealing with this? I can see this is upsetting my family. As these thoughts sort of move through your mind, what you might not know is that that directly impacts your adrenal glands. So those thoughts go down into your adrenal glands, and then there are hormones that actually get pushed out, chemical signals get pushed out, called cortisone. So cortisone basically uh, helps you with a fight and flight response. So Back in the day, if we really needed to avoid lions and tigers and all of that, it's great, it's very helpful. Even in today's society, if we're trying to cross the street and a car goes by too quickly, we have the capacity to take a step back and, and respond right away. But having that signal on all the time because of a stress response that's just not going away because it comes from the fact that we're ruminating on these thoughts means that we're actually impacting our organs negatively. So that can actually impact not just your mood, but your functioning of your, your you can get adrenal fatigue, um, you can also get digestive issues, you can get, uh, your immune system can be compromised by that. So whether or not you have a, a, a YouTube uh, sort of channel that you watch and you go through like a visualization practice with, um, or whether or not you attend a yoga class and there's an opportunity to do a meditation at the end of it, um, any source that you have may actually help to manage, if not alleviate, some of the fatigue you're dealing with. 
I also wanted to address sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene is really effective, and I spend a lot of time in my assessments talking about sleep. Um, and it's the one thing that most of my patients brush off right away. Well, I get up, you know, I'm this age, I'm getting up three or four times because I urinate because it's normal. I'm waking up, sometimes I'm feeling really overwhelmed, but it's normal because it's my age. And I do try my very best to educate on the value of sleep. I almost find it more effective to try to persuade someone to be open-minded to sleeping through the night more than I push about exercise or diet changes. If you're not able to sleep at night, it really does impact your stress level, your capacity for your organs to work efficiently. So trying to engage in uh, healthy sleep hygiene is really effective. So trying to go to bed and get up at the same time is a great way to sort of start. Um, exercising daily actually helps you to get into a deeper sleep too. You want to limit your naps. So ideally, you're taking shorter rest breaks or a short nap uh, less than an hour. Um, avoiding alcohol, avoiding caffeine, specifically in the evenings will do that. And this is the hardest thing for a lot of people. Some people find that their device, their cell phone, their iPad puts them to sleep. <laughs> it actually does stimulate the brain. So you might find that it puts you to sleep, but it could be like three hours after. So what you might find is that spending the last two to three hours before you sleep as a mindfulness practice of how to disengage from your device, um, maybe thinking about having a very small cup of chamomile tea because that is also meant to calm your nervous system, engaging in some sort of very simple stretching practice or your meditation practice in the evening, and just making sure that there has been a few hours between your meal and actually sleeping. And the biggest thing is, if you are trying to get yourself more hydrated, try not to do it at the end of the evening. A lot of people who are really excited and want to be hydrated sometimes don't necessarily remember until 7 p.m. at night and they end up frequently urinating all, uh, you know, throughout the evening. So those are just some tidbits on what to consider because if I'm asking of you to exercise and you're not sleeping well, it's just not gonna be as an, uh, as an effective tool. So these are some complementary therapies. Again, whether you're a member at Gilda's Club, at Wellspring, at Elixir, a lot of these practices are offered for free. Um, acupuncture is a great, uh, and has shown a lot of uh, positive research with managing fatigue. I would definitely recommend connecting with your oncologist or your medical team before you do it, just in case you have any concerns about it. Um, tai Chi or Qigong is a beautiful tool. Yoga is wonderful. As a yoga therapist, I suggest that if, if you don't have access to any of the, like the Wellspring sites or the Gilda Club um, site itself, um, if you want to go to a private yoga studio, consider the term yin yoga, Y-I-N. So it's different than a vinyasa class, it's different than a flow class where it's very aerobic centered, higher risk of injury, but when you're looking at a yin class, the concept is to calm your nervous system, which we talked a little bit about um, stress hormones, calming your nervous system and holding your stretches for three to five minutes with lots of support, whether you have blocks, straps, uh, and bolsters. Massage therapy can be really effective, mindfulness or meditation practices. Um, if you have a support group, that can be really um, engaging to make sure that you feel a sense of um, collaboration with how you're feeling. And art therapy is a beautiful practice. Journal writing, not necessarily just about fatigue, but any experiences that are showing up for you. Journal writing is really nice. Not filtering your thoughts, but writing exactly what's happening in the moment. Um, if you're interested, and this happens so much in my assessments, people who are sort of self, um, uh, self, uh, re really just uh, going into a health food store and choosing herbal medicine or supplements and um, not necessarily connecting with their team. So as we've heard in previous, um, previous talks today, is that if you are curious about herbal medicine or taking supplements, reconnect back with your team. Even if you're working with a naturopath that specializes in oncology, if you're working with a dietitian, if you're working with um, a herbal medicine specialist, 
At the end of the day, whatever is sort of described and written out, please do ask of your oncology team just to confirm it, um, just to make sure that it doesn't impact your medications that you're currently taking um, or any treatment. And I also strongly recommend this one app. Um, I don't sponsor them, but I think it's fabulous. It's called Untire. Um, it's a free app specifically looking at cancer-related fatigue. So it actually builds in how to schedule your day and asks you to report your fatigue throughout the day. Um, and again, if you have a caregiver that is also curious about fatigue, maybe not necessarily uh, fully understanding it yet, it's a great tool for yourself as well as your partner. So if you are really curious about it and you might not have access to a, a care team at this point, the Untire app is fantastic. So, Let's shift right into exercise. So from a research perspective, um, when we're looking at self-reports, how people describe how they feel about exercise, some benefits are body image and self-esteem, a, a noticeable increase with that. Hopefully the idea is that as your body composition is changing, um, you're maybe fitting back into the clothes that you were originally wearing, maybe you're noticing some muscle tone. So you're reconnecting back into your self-esteem, which can be, um, often discouraged when you're on treatment and also with all the different uh, changes physiologically that your body has to go through. Um, a lot of people do report that their sleep is improving and their appetite improves. Um, anxiety and depression are often things that people have described as either taking less medication for um, or they're just coping better because as we know, exercise does uh, really promote endorphin release, which is that happy hormone that's within our bodies that has to be accessed through, uh, accessed through movement. Um, brain fog, a lot of people have reported through self-report that it actually helps a lot with brain fog. And quality of life, so when you're returning back to hobbies, returning back to social interactions, you're more likely to achieve that goal, if that's important to you, if you incorporate exercise into your lifestyle. So just some other benefits, um, cardiovascular and musculoskeletal fitness, so your heart health improving, your muscle mass improving, uh, mental clarity, uh, managing fatigue, bone uh, mineral density, so if there's anyone on top of their diagnosis is also uh, dealing with osteoporosis or osteopenia, you will notice that exercise will help manage that too. Body composition, there was a, a, an excellent talk um, in the morning with a physician talking about sort of managing the uh, symptoms of, of um, I believe it was, um, basically managing your overall symptoms by reducing your waist circumference, so uh, body fat in the front of your body, um, but also looking at combining that with actually uh, muscle strength, because both of those together actually will make, you sh make sure that you feel the sense of accomplishment of your day-to-day -day tasks that might be impacted by your fatigue. Joint mobility is another thing, especially if you're taking a medication that impacts your, your joints, either you're noticing more creaking or if you had low levels of, of uh, arthritic changes, you might know, uh, might be aware that it's actually significantly worse since you've had treatment. So exercise will actually help you manage that. Your immune system uh, is often uh, positively impacted. Um, you reduce your risk of getting other cancer, uh, other uh, chronic related diseases in the future. And there, were, uh, there was one particular study that was fantastic looking at lymphoma and uh, prevention of relapse. That was a meta-analysis that was done. So there, there are really good benefits to exercise. And it's just a matter of figuring out where you are right now and what you think you can do um, realistically at this point. And that's what we're going to be chatting about. So sometimes there happens to be a delay between someone hearing about um, exercise and then eventually meeting with me. And some of those delays could be based on the referral taking a long time, but they're sometimes relayed to a lot of myths that people are sort of trying to come to terms with. So there are a lot of people that, when I'm doing their initial assessment, telling me they're concerned that their fatigue will worsen with exercise. It is possible that fatigue can make you, sorry, exercise can make you more tired. But really, it comes down to the type of exercise that is offered to you, that you choose for yourself. So, Certain levels of exercise can actually be health promoting, energy promoting, and then there's other forms that are too vigorous, that might be too exhausting, that will deplete you. 
Um, some people have actually told me that they're worried that their cancer will return when they exercise. Some people feel that if they are um, on a, a rebounder, jumping up and down, or on a recumbent bike, I've heard some people say they're worried that their cancer will worsen. Um, there is no literature on that. Um, some people actually feel that they want to wait until after treatment is complete, but often most research is recommending that if it is possible, if you, if it, whether it's possible for you to uh, be driven to a, a Wellspring or a Gilda's Club or even having access at home to exercise, it's actually really effective to exercise while you're on treatment to help you better manage your symptoms of your treatment. Um, and then there are some people that feel that, well, I'm going to wait until the fatigue is completely gone and then I'm going to exercise. But again, as we talked about earlier, um, some people are able to uh, cope and deal and are aware that their fatigue has an end date and then there are a lot of people that are not so much aware and are dealing with it long term. So exercise at any point of your journey will be um, effective. So what are the guidelines? What do they tell us? So as a registered kinesiologist, we have also guidelines of what we share, how we set goals with our um, participants and patients. So uh, Cancer Care Ontario, um, as well as the Can Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology, has recommended 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise um, that should also include, uh, include resistance training. So right away, that might feel really overwhelming because again, we're not talking about sort of a casual stroll, we're talking about getting your heart rate up. So that could be approximately looking at 30 minutes a day uh, per week, sorry, 30 minutes per week. And so my recommendation is when you're looking at this sheet, know that that can be an option of a long-term goal, but what you might be starting off with is five to seven minutes a day of moderate intensity exercise. That's where you're bridging yourself between attempting exercise and not being defeated by, de defeated by exercise. Um, exercise ideally should be tailored for you uh, based on your tolerance at this time. And there should be a progression to exercise. So if you've been doing the same movement, if you've already started exercising and you've been with your three pounds doing your bicep curl for months at a time, two sets 20 times. So I'm uh, sorry, two sets 10 times. So you're hitting 20 reps and you've been doing the same thing for months at a time, your muscle mass will peak. So that means that you're not gonna be gaining much more in terms of the, the mass itself, as well as your energy level will also peak at a certain point. So you wanna know and be educated on how to gently progress yourself safely. So who do you work with? So say for example, you're very new to exercise, you haven't had a routine before, um, or you used to exercise for a long time, but you're feeling a bit nervous returning back. I know I've had a couple members, uh, or Wellspring uh, patients in particular, that have told me that I've been working out for a long time, but I don't feel ready to go back to the YMCA because I'm concerned about my immune system. And to be honest, my program was really intense, and I don't know how to take those steps to build back up. So you may be having access to seeing a registered kinesiologist, uh, a certified exercise physiologist, and also a physiotherapist. So having access to um, any of those uh, specialists can be really effective in terms of exercise building, education, and then of course, progression and maintenance. So this is the interesting question, and this is sort of an ongoing discussion slash fight with my mom. <laughs> what is the difference between physical activity and exercise? So, uh, for example, um, there, is, there are uh, multiple people I've worked with in the past where there is a certain belief that if I'm taking my laundry basket upstairs and then back down, that's exercise. Or, you know, after a really long time, I'm finally, you know, washing uh, the dishes. So that is under the boundary or the, uh, or the, um, uh, the understanding of physical activity. So it's, it's motion, it's day-to-day uh, -day activities accomplished, but it doesn't necessarily reference exercise. Exercise contributes to physical activity, but physical activity actually is not exercise. Exercise, as we will identify together in the next few slides, is very intention-oriented. You're looking at progressing yourself. You're looking at building your intensity. You're choosing uh, a type of exercise to do, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But it is intention-focused. So how do we even start? 
That's the question. So the formula that I think is really effective, that works really well, that we've, I've personally learned a lot in school is the FIT formula. Frequency, intensity, time, and, and type. So those are really the four steps to determining what kind of exercise, how often you're gonna be doing it, and really how to basically be on track with your workouts. So frequency looks at is what is your commitment level? Um, so at this point, if you are uh, dealing with trying to cope with exercise, you may be looking at once a week of a committed exercise routine. So this one picture might be a bit much, but it's someone biking. But what that might look like for you is maybe a, a, a seven to 10 minute moderate intensity walk, either around your house, listening to music or going out in your neighborhood or if you have access to a treadmill that would be looking at that giving yourself one to two days rest before you engage in the next exercise because again as you're learning more and more about your body you don't want to jam pack your schedule with something every single day so again over time maybe in the next few months you might be adding in another session or another session again the goal eventually hopefully being a minimum of 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a day so intensity is how hard should one be working so you may start off with a walking program that eventually turns into a speed walking program and eventually if your goal is to go back to running if you are a runner that gives you an example of intensity so again this is a very old picture but some people now have fitbits or garments to access their uh, heart rate as well as their steps so uh, the goal being the steps of anywhere from seven to ten thousand steps is what you're building up towards Again, the expectation isn't tomorrow to hit 7,000 steps. It's if you have access to that technology, just having the acknowledgement of what is your usual day. Is it 1,500 steps and seeing if it's possible the next day or even the day after to go up by you know, another 100 steps if possible. So how, when, I, when I'm actually working with someone one-on-one -on -one and they're on the treadmill, for example, I would ask them the question, uh, which is basically, a scale of one to 10, how challenging is this exercise? So the ideal number you want to be at when you're working out is between four to six. That is what we talked about as moderate intensity exercise. So one would basically be where we are right now, sitting in our chairs, not necessarily moving, um, and then it builds up towards that 10, I would even say nine or 10, is not a healthy range to be in, especially from a heart health perspective. It actually will um, increase your lactic acid buildup. It'll contribute to further fatigue and more likely you may be injured. So how I can determine if someone is at 10 out of 10 is if you happen to be on some equipment, whether it's a, a bike or you're on the treadmill and you're not able to communicate with me. We call that the talk test. I walk by, I ask you about your weekend and you're completely out of breath and not communicating, that's a 10 out of 10. So if you are practicing, say, with your friend, caregiver, and you're going out for a moderate intensity walk, ideally you should be able to talk to each other as you're going. You may be noticing a little bit of shortness of breath, maybe you're feeling warm, maybe there's a little drizzle of sweat or glistening as we call it for women. Uh, the concept really is, is that as long as you can communicate with each other, that means you're at a healthy range. And I also specifically for uh, my patients who've been diagnosed with lymphoma as well as um, other uh, cancer groups that are looking at fatigue as their biggest barrier to exercise, I, use, I also use the one to 10 scale, but differently. So zero basically means you're not tired. You're very energetic. You're having a great day. You slept well. 10 on the other hand means it's complete exhaustion. Um, you're basically um, not feeling recovered, you're feeling unwell, maybe possibly nauseous. And so when you're working out, and I ask you specifically, rather than using the rate of perceived scale, which was the earlier, earlier um, image, I would focus more on fatigue. Because I'm safe, I feel very safe exercising with someone who's dealing with uh, fatigue, but I wouldn't want them to get past seven. And the reason is, is that there's a certain point when you get past seven where again, your nervous system becomes very hyperactive where then you're just gonna get depleted after. So I've had experience where people have exercised, they're feeling good, but they didn't necessarily feel like they were reporting accurately. They felt in the moment they were four out of 10, but really by the end of their workout, 
they were like nine out of 10 and it took them two days to recover. So just kind of getting in tune with your body a little bit can be helpful, but working with your healthcare um, provider, whether it's a kin or a physio, can be really effective because they will consistently ask you with every exercise you're doing so that there's a cutoff point. So if the intention is to work out for an hour, maybe when you get to six out of 10, that could be 20 minutes in and that's your workout. And that's something to build up towards. And then time, recognizing that there is something kind of heavy about being told to exercise 150 minutes of a moderate intensity exercise can be really tough. But starting off small, something reasonable, something really effective as seven to 10 minutes to begin with. If you are very passionate and would like to try to hit 30 minutes because you feel like you have the energy to attempt it, I would even say for the first few times, see if you can separate that into maybe 10 minutes in the morning, 10 in the afternoon, 10 in the evening. Start with that. See if you can build up your stamina so eventually you can hit your 30 minutes. And then again, choosing the exercise that's really effective for you. This gets asked a lot. What is better? Is it better to do aerobic training, which is cardio, or resistance training, which is, uh, again, it's uh, working with bands or weights or your own body weight? At the end of the day, the research has identified that both are really effective and they do different things. Your cardiovascular health um, can be impacted by having being more sedentary, so you're not walking very often. So walking is really effective. Uh, being on a treadmill, being on a bike is very effective. Swimming, if you're allowed to swim, is very effective. But it's also just as effective to resistance train, especially if you're looking at improving your posture, um, improving your muscle mass and your muscle tone. And again, we talked a little bit about osteoporosis and, and other possible conditions that you might be dealing with that are actually independent of cancer. So it is helpful to know about both. So if you feel ready to attempt, both are actually really, really effective. It's important when you choose to exercise to make sure you build yourself up in the moment. So if you are deciding that you are gonna go for a moderate intensity, you know, seven to 10 minute walk, see if it's possible to warm up ahead of time. Some warm up routines would be just as simple as swaying your arms, swaying your legs before you get outside. It could be walking slower to start with and then picking up your pace and also making sure that you cool down, you slow your pace down before you uh, finish. Um, you want to make sure that you stretch. To try to convince people to stretch is, I would think, is the hardest part of my job. Asking them not to leave abruptly is very difficult. And the stretching is really, really important when you're looking at prevention of injury, but also looking at the fact that there's a lot of lactic acid that naturally builds up when you work out, and you want to be able to make sure that you don't, you're not dealing with the soreness the next day from exercise. So making sure that you stretch um, at least 10 minutes after you've worked out, ideal is 20 minutes, is a really beautiful t tool to, again, calm your nervous system, but make sure, you, again, if you are thinking of exercising regularly, it will prevent any possible injury from happening in the future. And of course, making sure you're sipping on water while you're working out and after. So if you're not 100% sure if you should be exercising, um, some things to discuss with your doctor and just to sort of make sure that they're uh, aware of, uh, you're aware of is that if there's any risk of having low white blood cell count or low platelet count or um, you know, experiencing a fever or an active infection or being anemic or uh, feeling unsteady or really quite fragile or having any issues with um, uh, cancer in the bones, you want to make sure that you get consent from your doctor. So if this is not something you're experiencing, but again, you're feeling a bit nervous to start, just double check with your oncologist, your medical team, just double check that it's okay that you exercise. Particularly with the Wellspring program, we do ask that there be a physician that signs a consent form saying that you are able to exercise. Exercise, some motivation is required. So hopefully the dinosaur is not fear that's pushing you forward, but hopefully it's the, the response within yourself saying, I'm ready to start. I'm ready to engage in a little bit more. Um, but again, everyone's level of motivation is different. So a huge part of acknowledging 
um, motivation is really coming to terms with understanding where does it come from and, and at the end of the day, what are some possible barriers? When you bring up what could possibly cause a um, ability to not work out on certain days or what is it that you're hoping to change? So if you're having shortness of breath and you happen to live in a two-story house where your bedroom is on the second floor and you're completely out of breath on the top, sometimes ha making those goals in your mind of like, well, I don't want to deal with that forever or even short term, um, you want to be, be able to acknowledge that and, and say how important that is to you. Um, what is it that you're not super thrilled about where you are right now with your activity level? What are you excited about in terms of the future, in terms of if you choose to engage in exercise, what possible outcomes will come from that? Um, and of course, really, really coming to terms with what are obstacles, whether it's access to equipment at home, whether it is um, having different centers, whether it's Gilda's Club or Wellspring or really any site that will offer you exercise or rehabilitation options and seeing if it's actually close by uh, for you, but coming to terms with understanding what, what are the biggest barriers to wanting to participate. And a huge part of determining, at least for myself as a uh, exercise specialist, is it's very easy in an assessment as you're ending the assessment and you're asking your patient, what are your goals? What are you hoping to work on? Most people will say the phrase, I want more energy. I want to build my stamina. The thing is that as an exercise professional, I will be doing multiple assessments throughout your workout. Um, I, I will reassess you, I'll do your baseline fitness again. So if I checked your weight, your height, your waist circumference, I'm gonna recheck that two or three times throughout the time that we're working together. But it really helps me figure out a great program when it can be very specific. So we use the, the, the acronym SMART, uh, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely goal. So I'll give you an example of, of one person uh, who basically just a few weeks ago had a really specific goal in mind and it came down to the stairs. So everything is basically accessible upstairs for them. They're in a townhouse. So there's a living room on the bottom, but then in terms of their kitchen and bedroom, it's on the second floor. So they were hoping that within six weeks, they'll be able to go up the stairs without having to take a rest break in one of the rooms. And so they were able, and with that information, I recognized, okay, aside from cardio, I really need to build up their leg strength, um, their, their calf muscles. So I looked at squats and heel raises. Um, I looked at doing a little bit of push up so I can work on their posture. I looked at core building, so making sure they're able to breathe through their diaphragm and tighten through their lower abdominal muscles. So it gives your uh, exercise, um, specialist enough information that we get really specific exercises to help build up towards your goals so that in six to eight weeks when we kind of reference back to your goals, we'll be like, okay, this is accomplished or we need to work on this a little bit more. So finally, at the end of the day, when it comes to exercise, it really comes down to preference. So if you have a dance background and uh, a modified Zumba class where it's predominantly sitting in a chair feels really enjoyable, um, more likely that you'll commit to it, that's amazing. If you feel that participating in a, in a walking group with other people um, in your neighborhood is really effective, at the end of the day, at least when you get started, it's very, very important to choose things that you enjoy doing because you're more likely to do it long term. And I've worked with many people where their goal is just to feel a bit more fit, of course, very specific goals, but feel fit so that they can return back to certain activities, so going back to a yoga class, going back to a, a dance-based class, um, or even just returning back to their day-to-day -day activities and taking care of their families. So it's really important at the end of the day when you're choosing something for yourself to do that you think it's fun. That's really, really important. So I wanted to leave you with some resources. Um, we talked about the Untire app. If you're curious about that, just playing around with that, that's a, that's a free app. But I also wanted to recognize that Wellspring has multiple locations. That's at the downtown site. There's one near Sunnybrook, Oakville, and Brampton. So they have access to a 20-week um, exercise program. And I just want to uh, make this very clear. It's free to join Wellspring. It's free for all the programming. Um, so it's 20 weeks working with a, 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 an exercise specialist. You get an individualized 
individualized program and supervision for the entire 20 weeks with a, of course, home program and uh, some resources in terms of exercise bands uh, accessible for you. They also have yoga classes that are defined more as gentle yoga. So just learning how to start to practice yoga if you've had very little experience, that, those are great classes. And Qi Life, which I would have to say is one of the most popular classes. It's a combination of Tai Chi and Qigong. Uh, Gilda's Club has yoga classes, also very gentle yoga classes. Pilates, so if you're looking at rebuilding and really working through your abdominal strength, um, Pilates is a beautiful program. And I'm not sure if anyone has had access to this Healthy Steps, which is a very popular program, also at Elixir, that's also uh, at Gilda's Club, which is very dance focused, but they also use a lot of resistance bands. Elixir is an amazing program, which again is at the basement of Toronto General Hospital. They run an eight week, uh, it's a cancer education and exercise program. Uh, which is really, really well run. Uh, Canwell is another cancer exercise program that's out of Hamilton, Burlington, and Brantford. It's through the YMCAs, and it's a 12-week supervised program. As, again, it's very, very much individualized. And then there's Active Match. So if, again, uh, accessibility to attend uh, any of these sites just doesn't seem like it's likely, Active Match is pretty great. Um, please check out their website. It's a free online service. It is specifically for women um, who've been diagnosed with any form of cancer. Uh, to find their perfect exercise partner or small group. So if you live in a particular location, say you're in Scarborough or out in Ajax, and you maybe live independently or you're not sure how you're going to be able to get again to one of the sites if you go on active match um, they ask you to fill out a little questionnaire and then they group you with either one person if you prefer or a group of people in and around your area so again another motivational tool is to be around other people who want to exercise so that there is some sort of uh, adherence or interest in in wanting to continue because you know that there's other people at the end of the street waiting for you to show up um, so these are some resources in the GTA that are accessible. And um, I encourage you, all, all of these programs are for free. Um, so I encourage you to um, check them on online, call, um, feel free to, I know with Gilda's Club in Wellspring, they highly recommend coming in and just taking a tour of the space, see if energetically you feel like this is the place you would want to exercise, you feel safe here emotionally as well as physically. And from there you can determine what the right steps are for you. Um, and again, if you have any questions, especially very specific ones relating to exercise, I'd be happy to stay in after class. But um, I want to thank you all for listening, and I encourage you, if you have any questions, to please feel free to ask me. Thank you. Out of curiosity, has anyone attended the Wellspring exercise program? Oh, amazing. OK, great. Good. Does anyone currently have a routine in place, an exercise routine that they're you know, they're engaged in on a regular basis. Okay, okay, that's good. Well, it's a beautiful thing to start with. And again, as I was saying that if you have any questions, um, the best thing to do is if you can engage in any of the particular sites, the idea is you wanna feel supported because when you're coping and dealing with fatigue, the last thing you want is to be agreeable to exercise and then feel nervous about you know, injuring yourself or getting more tired. So again, if anyone has any specific questions afterwards, feel free to ask me. Thank you so much. <laughs>